The title for this talk, Dynamic Desert, might seem odd for an environment that appears stable and unchanging, as is reflected in this pair of matched photographs from the Tonkwa Karoo taken nearly a century apart. On the surface of it, little has changed and one might be tempted to think of the entire Karoo in this way, an empty landscape dominated uniformly by small shrubs stretching to the horizon, unchanging over space and time. What I hope to show in this talk, however, is that nothing could be further from the truth. The Karoo is an extremely diverse and highly dynamic environment, and not only in terms of its biology. The archaeological and cultural history of the region is equally special and increasingly under threat from land use practices that do not appreciate the unique richness of the Karoo and the irreversible impact that these practices might have on our heritage. When I started my academic career in 1985, I knew nothing of the Karoo and had only experienced it as being somewhere in the middle of the country on the road from some place to some place else. I was as clueless about the Karoo as I look in this photograph as sitting next to Richard Cowling, my PhD supervisor's combi, near Klipla. I had no idea, for example, of the richness of the succulent Karoo and the mass displays of flowers in good years. But it seems that at that time in the 1980s, no one knew much about the Karoo at all, as can be seen in this graph of Karoo research output over time. Even by the end of the 1980s, there were fewer than 100 peer-reviewed papers on the Karoo. However, this was all to change with the Karoo Biome Project, project of course, led by Richard and under Brian Huntley's cooperative scientific programs. Our knowledge of the Karoo has grown considerably since then without letter, which you can read about in our recent contribution to the South African Journal of Science. In fact, it was only in 1986 that we settled on the idea of there being two Karoos, thanks to the work of Mike Rutherford and Bobby Westfall, who gave us the biomes of South Africa map, on which so much of our biological and conservation science is now based. While the details are constantly being updated, the plant ecologists at least all agree that we have a smaller succulent Karoo biome in the west, which is characterized by winter rain with strong links to the Cape floristic region to the south. This biome is widely touted as the richest desert in the world, with over 6,000 plant species, many of which are succulents and with very high levels of endemism amongst plants, insects and reptiles. By contrast, the much larger Nama Karoo biome to the east experiences summer rain and contains only a third as many species, mostly grasses and shrubs, few of which are endemic. Both biomes are considered to still be in a natural state, although, as we shall see, this term natural means different things to different people. Even though Biologists have developed a very useful and neat two Karoos system to their understanding of the region. It's never as simple as that. Local inhabitants of the Karoo have a wide range of names for different parts of the Karoo, such as the Tanka Karoo, the Kop, the Hantam, Bushmanland, and so on, often with rather vague boundaries to each of the areas mentioned. But there are also magisterial district boundaries and local municipality boundaries some of which have been redrawn over the centuries of successive governments. This makes it quite tricky sometimes to reconcile government census records over the historical period. In this seminar, I'm going to address four main questions as they relate to the main theme of the talk. First, I want to outline how the Karoo has been used over time and what the impacts of these different land use practices have been on the region. Then I'd like to share with you what I think is one of the most impressive South African conservation success stories of the last 20 years and the influence that one person's gener generosity and vision had on this process. Finally, as a Karoo ecologist and conservationist, one increasingly feels on the back foot as new threats to the region emerge, 
seemingly on a weekly basis, I'd like to highlight some of these which uh, I feel are most important. Any discussion of land use in Southern Africa would need to start with a long occupation of the subcontinent by Stone Age and Iron Age people as evidenced in the nearly 15,000 sites that have been recorded. While there's some presence of sites in the Karoo, the data on which the map is based does not include the full extent of Garth Sampson's work in the Sikar Valley, where he and colleagues documented nearly 14,000 individual prehistoric sites. The map on the right shows the phenomenal density of these sites in the region and provides a far more telling picture of the true extent of human occupation of the Karoo over a period of 700,000 years. The details of Garth's work in the Sikar Valley in the eastern Karoo are worth sharing as they show as clearly as anyone has ever done that the Karoo contains a heritage like none other. Garth's survey covered nearly 5,000 square kilometers. That's an area 10 times the size of the Cape Peninsula in which teams of five to seven people walk for nearly 16 months mapping all stone tools and cultural components which they found. The resulting database, which now has been digitized shows how hunting and gathering societies organize themselves spatially in the landscape. And the map on the right shows the arrangement around a waterhole of cultural artifacts of different ages from potentially 700,000 years before present to relatively recent. It's worth spending time looking at God's maps and let it sink in just how remarkable is the heritage that is contained in the Karoo. God's work confirms the observations made, for example, by William Birchall 200 years earlier when he traveled through the Karoo and remarked, travelers may often pass quite through, the, through their country without seeing a human being, yet it would be erroneous to suppose, therefore, that it was uninhabited. For there are few springs of water in the vicinity of which a bushman kraal may not be found. The Karoo, of course, also supports the site where pastoralism has first been recorded in South Africa at Spukhrafir in Namakuland. There's much debate about how livestock first arrived in the region, but from about 2,000 years ago, livestock appear to have been a persistent presence in the subcontinent, increasing significantly from the 7th century, coincident with significant evidence of agro-pastoralists in the archaeological record. When the commander of the Cape Garrison, Robert Jacob Gordon, traveled to Namakwaland in 1779, he provided some demographic information of Nama-speaking herders who were present in the region at the time. This was many decades after successive smallpox epidemics had decimated people of the region, and the size and distribution of early herder communities is difficult to reconstruct. While it is a long and somewhat complicated history, many of the descendants of the early occupants of the region are still herding in the communal areas of Namakuland today. They manage their herds and cope with the pervasive uncertainty that characterizes the climatic and ec economic environment of the region. People from the communal areas such as Steinkopf and Lelifontein and Komachas also maintain several cultural traditions associated with herding lifestyles, which draw on indigenous and traditional knowledge concerned with how they graze and look after their herds. While only a few thousand people in South Africa, mostly in the Rochtesfeld, still speak Nama, many local names, casual expressions and names of plants still bear Nama names. After a relatively slow start, the colonial frontier moved quickly across the Karoo and by 1770 had reached Grafenep. Despite a protracted frontier war with the San, by 1847, the upper Karoo right up to the Kharib River had also been annexed to form part of the Cape Colony. Early settler farmers, the so-called Trekbura of the Karoo, adopted many of the practices used by the original Khoi pastoralists. 
access to water was obviously critical, as was the ability to move in the unpredictable environments of the Karoo, often in search of wild animals. The use of reed mat or Mikey's houses to create a shelter that could be easily assembled and packed up again proved ideal. Even today in Namaqualand, many sheep farmers follow a rough transhumans pattern with a farm in the winter rainfall coastal region and another in the summer rainfall bushmanland interior. Large herds of 5,000 sheep or more on trek between the farms during the change of season or after good rains can delay you on some of the more commonly used roads in the region. While the impact of disease, theft, subjugation and genocide of the emerging colony on hunter-gatherer and herder communities was swift and devastating, the impact on the environment took a little longer to manifest. It wasn't until farmers settled more permanently in one place, plowed the lowlands or accessed areas of the Karoo that were previously inaccessible because of the lack of water that the full impact of their activities emerged. Wild animals were eliminated or excluded from areas by fences and replaced by large herds of domestic sheep and goats across much of the Karoo. The first murmurings that all was not well with the Karoo are made known towards the end of the 19th century. Unfortunately, this rise of agricultural intensification in the Karoo in the late 19th century coincided with a downturn in rainfall in an area that was already relatively marginal for livestock. PhD student Gina Arena has analyzed the long-term rainfall record for 18 climate stations in the eastern Karoo over a 140-year period from 1878 to 2018. Her results show that the last decade of the 19th century up until about 1902 was relatively wet across much of the summer rainfall crew. But for the next 70 years, until the mid-1970s, the eastern Karoo experienced a series of repeated dry years, as is shown by the prevalence of red in this figure in the middle part of the time series. The very heavy rainfall years of 1974 and 1976 however, heralded 40 years of relatively high rainfall, which has only recently reverted to more drought-like conditions. Farmers knew that rainfall patterns had changed and told the various committees and commissions that had been set up to investigate both the change in climate as well as the increase in land degradation that was associated primarily with Karoo environments. Despite testimony of farmers, such as in this quote, which suggests that there is little doubt that rainfall has diminished in recent years, statistical support for the idea was simply not strong enough. Dr. Cocott, for example, the climate specialist on the 1948 Desert Encroachment Committee, seen here on the left of this photograph taken by John Acox at Kabup near Pofade in Bushmanland during a break from one of their meetings, discounted a decline in rainfall as being a reason for the deterioration of the Karoo. As in other reports from 1914 and 1923, the blame for desertification was placed squarely on the farmers, primarily on overgrazing and the lack of proper grazing management systems. Just a quick aside here, the quirkaboom in front of Dr. Cocott in 1948 was still present in 2003, but has subsequently died. The 1948 Desert Encroachment Committee report leaned heavily on John Acox's maps of vegetation change in South Africa which he was just finishing as part of his countrywide survey of the felt types of South Africa. In the maps, John, seen here doing what he loved most, which was looking at felt, provided a powerful and enduring theory of how South Africa's vegetation had changed over time. His first map 
shows the vegetation of the country before people settled in the region, which in keeping with the thinking at the time, he erroneously pegged at 1400 AD. The boundary between the Karoo and grassland vegetation is of importance here, as it is the grasslands in particular which John felt had been decimated by European farmers. His map of 1950 shows a northeastward expanding Karoo with advanced patches of Karoo shrubs approaching the current borders of Gauteng. And he was not wrong in this, as Karoo shrubs were clearly starting to dominate the Free State grasslands, such as at the site of Vepina on the Lesotho border. His 1950 map also shows the desert biome expanding into the vacuum left by the eastward expansion of the Karoo. More importantly, John argued, if we carried on like this, then by 2050, much of South Africa will be comprised of Karoo and desert. Thankfully, he was wrong about this, as one, as one can see in this 2009 photograph of Vepina. Uh, and which I will elaborate on in some of the remaining slides. One of the main reasons for why the Karoo has not taken over South Africa is not only because the last 50 years have been slightly wetter, in the eastern Karoo at least, but also because livestock numbers have declined. Agricultural census data show a reduction in cattle, sheep, goats and horses since their peaks in the 1920s and 30s. Sheep numbers dominate the record and have declined by two-thirds from 11 million animals in 1937 to just 4 million in 2007. The reasons for the decline are complex but include a shift away from subsistence, subsistence to the commercialization of the industry, the stock reduction scheme of the South African government, which attempted to actively reduce livestock and restore the Karoo, and a reduction in the number of small, unsustainable farming operations as well. In fact, one of the most noticeable features of the Karoo today is the number of abandoned farms that are evident across the region, one of which is so beautifully depicted in this painting by Willem Pretorius entitled Verbeiganger or Passerby. As farms became amalgamated into larger and larger economic units and people moved to the cities, many homesteads were abandoned and have not been occupied in decades. That then is a very brief history of how the Karoo has been used over time. What have been the impacts of these different land use practices and where are we today in terms of the degradation trajectory predicted by John Acox in 1953? The first job I had after completing my PhD in 1989 was to address this question, which in the meantime had become established dogma. The 1977 United Nations Conference on Desertification Harold Dregny's excellent 1983 Global Synthesis of Desertification, and even UNEP repeated John Acox's version of Karoo degradation. I teamed up again with Richard Cowling, senior on the right, and using a few different approaches, including historical photographs and repeated botanical surveys, we found little support for the expanding Karoo hypothesis. We suggested instead that the Karoo might not have been as grassy as proposed and hinted at the role that an increase in seasonal rainfall might have had on the Karoo. But these were very early days in this debate, of course, and in 1994, I had the privilege of working with UCT colleagues, William Bond and Willie Stock, which helped to refine the story a little. Because Karoo grasses possess a C4 photosynthetic pathway and Karoo shrubs are mostly C3, they leave a different isotopic signature in the organic matter contained in the soil profile. By measuring the ratio of C4 to C3 isotopes down the profile, it's possible to determine if deeper, read older, parts of the profile were dominated by grasses or by shrubs. 
This was a time when both William and I could still wield a pick and shovel and we dug pits to nearly 60 centimeters, which is no mean feat in these hard Karoo soils. The results showed that the western part of the Karoo was probably always dominated by shrubs and had never supported a waving sweet grass fell. The area between Murraysburg and the Orange River at Colesburg was probably also never a true grassland, as envisaged by John Acox, but a mixture rather of grasses and shrubs. The isotopic signature of soils in the Free State, however, indicated that the area was a true grass felt in the past and had undergone extreme changes in the recent past. John Acox's idea of Karoo shrubs marching to Pretoria had some support in this analysis. The question of what has happened to the Karoo over space and time has kept me busy for most of my career and I return to this theme time and again. I built most of my understanding around the interpretation of changes seen in the comparison of historical and more recent ground photographs, although I've also used other approaches such as aerial photographs or long-term botanical surveys as well. I've had a lot of help with this work from many students and from colleagues such as Rick Rohde, Sam Jack and James Patek, amongst many others who have all been part of this interesting work. In order to take a repeat photograph, however, you first need the historical image. We're very fortunate in Southern Africa in having such a rich photographic history. Botanists such as I.B. Paul Evans, Rudolf Marloth, Margaret Levins, and John Acox, amongst many others, took photographs of Southern African landscapes during their careers. And they are a rich source of information for anyone interested in traveling back in time. Our libraries, museums, and even some NGOs, such as the Mountain Club of South Africa, have also kept their photographic history. To date, our collection of historical landscape photographs at the Plant Conservation Unit comprises about 30,000 images from more than 80 photographers. Once you have the photograph and have found the general location of where the original photograph was taken, the work really starts. Since so much of my understanding is based on this approach, I should spend a little time explaining how we collect and analyze the information from the photographs. Over the years, we've developed set protocols for each of these processes. First, you need to find the exact location, then set up the tripod and start with the documentation process. This involves not only the obvious things like recording the GPS coordinates, drawing a sketch map to help future visitors, documenting the cameras and settings for the range of photographs that you take, including a panorama of the location, but most importantly also the changes that are evident in the landscape. The way in which we document the changes is to firstly divide the landscape into different landforms, such as rivers, plains and slopes, and then to physically walk into the image, sampling each of these landforms in turn. Ideally, a permanent record of the transect can be created by using the breadcrumbs trail option on a GPS. We also usually take additional photographs of each of the landforms, such as this one of the Sandy River course, as well as of the dominant or important species, and we make notes of what we see in the landscape that could help us in interpreting the changes that have occurred over time. Our approach in the field is mostly qualitative, but once we get back to the lab and have matched the historical and repeat photographs, we try and provide a more quantitative assessment of the changes evident over time. We've tried a range of different approaches, but what we've settled on for the biome level summaries is an estimate of cover based on a five point vegetation cover change index. We usually get three or four ecologists together who look at a pair of images and decide through consensus whether the cover of different growth forms has increased or decreased according to the criteria shown here. After doing this for all the matched photographs in a biome, we simply count the number of photographs in each class and express this as a percent of the total number of photos for the different landforms in each biome. We have about 
300 locations that we visited in the succulent and Namakaru biomes that have been rephotographed, although they distributed rather patchily over the two Karoos. So what do the photo comparisons show? Most show little change in vegetation, although more repeats reflect an increase in cover than a decrease. The ephemeral rivers represented by the gray histograms in the top graph showed the greatest increase in cover. Fewer than 10% of the comparisons showed a decrease in cover in both biomes. The take home message here is mostly stable with about a third of the sites showing an increase in vegetation cover. So what does this look like on the ground? I'll start with the succulent karoo biome where the decline in cultivated fields is noticeable. In the top photograph southwest of Springbok, fields were still being cultivated in 1957, but 50 years later they'd been abandoned and were slowly being colonized by early successional species and even some later successional species as well. This, this recovery of old lands is evident throughout Namaqualand, but ecological processes are slow and more than 80 years at least is required for meaningful recovery. Heavy grazing by goats, sheep and donkeys usually results in the loss of perennial succulent shrubs and their replacement by annuals and short-lived species such as are seen in this 1939 image in the Guchab Nature Reserve east of Springbok. Rest from grazing will result in the return of perennial succulent species, but it takes time. In some localities, such as near Kubus in the Ruchtersfeld, heavy overgrazing has removed plant cover, which has started the process of degradation that is just about unstoppable. The loss of Vegetation enables small sand particles to be blown around and this makes it virtually impossible for any seedlings to establish as they are quickly destroyed by sand grains. A large portion of the sandy plains around Kubus have lost their cover of the succulent shrub Brownanthus pseudo-schlichtianus, which used to slow wind speeds at the soil surface and prevent soil movement. But for the most part in the succulent karoo biome, these two pairs characterize the kind of changes you are most likely to find in a comparison of repeat photographs. In the photograph on the left taken near Lurie's Fontaine in 1920 and again in 2005, there's clearly a slight increase in cover of low shrubs. However, in the photograph on the right, which is on the road from Nivotville to Calfinia, and which was first photographed by John Acox in 1958, there's very little change to speak of. The same species, and in some cases, even the same individuals, are still present in the same bush clumps nearly 50 years later when Rick and I visited the site. It's a bit easier to document change when there's a mixture of shrubs and trees in the landscape, such as in this wide open valley, just south of Toesburg in the Ladysmith Karoo. Here we have three photographs from 1990, 1993, and 2014 and one is quite hard pressed to find any major change in the landscape. Many of the same trees are still present, although at the browse line they're less apparent, especially on those species that are more palatable to livestock. The same plant communities still occupy the same environments in 2014 that they did nearly 100 years earlier in 1919. Ephemeral rivers are critical habitats in dryland ecosystems. Water flows through them occasionally and change usually occurs more rapidly in ephemeral rivers than on the plains. Rivers are also often good indicators of environmental health for the wider region as well. As our earlier graph suggests, it's in the ephemeral river systems where woody cover has increased the most, as you can see from these two sites, one near von Reinsdorf and the other near Lanesburg. While other species are present in the rivers and sometimes aliens as well, such as Prosopis or Oleander, most of the change in woody cover that you see here is because of the increase in Acacia or Vichelia karoo. Our interpretation of long-term environmental change in the succulent karoo biome might need to change as the region has just come through the biggest drought in living memory and some areas are still being impacted. 
Anecdotal evidence suggests that some populations of succulent species in the Rochtesfeld, including some of the iconic tree aloes, have been devastated by the drought. Perhaps the most convincing canary in the coal mine to date is provided by Nick Hellman, Uta Schmidl's 2020 article in Felt and Flora. Their documentation of widespread mortality of several key species in the lowlands of Namakulan provides the clearest warning yet of things to come. It seems that the plains environments are particularly badly affected, such as you can see in the right-hand photograph. What about changes in the Namakuru biome? As I mentioned earlier, the story here has been dominated by John Acox's views of an eastward expanding Karoo, which was engulfing the Free State grasslands, largely because of overgrazing. Climate change projections suggest a similar contraction of grasslands, but this time it's because of climate change and a general aridification of the region. I've had the good, for, uh, the good fortune of working with colleagues like Morto Masabelele, James Gambiza, and William Bond on the problem. And Morto's PhD and subsequent publications rejected this view of a desertified Karoo. A general summary of change in the Nama Karoo is shown in the figure in the bottom right and shows that the majority of mortals matched photos either show little change in vegetation cover or an increase, especially in the cover of grasses. This story seems to be the gift that keeps on giving and recent work by PhD student Gina Arena has both broadened and deepened our understanding of what's going on in the region. Over the last three years, for her PhD, Gina has analyzed the data from over 18 climate stations, resurveyed 27 of Pit Roo's original transects in the eastern Karoo, rephotographed more than 100 sites, and looked at historical stocking rates to document environmental change in the eastern Karoo. Her results suggest that the trend of increasing grass cover has, if anything, intensified over time both in the Namakuru biome as well as in the grassland biome. And it's also not just poor quality grass species that have increased in cover at sites that were previously dominated by Karoo shrubs. She has so shown using a standard rangeland ecology approach that the carrying capacity, the CC in the bottom of the slide, has increased nearly fivefold in the Karoo and has more than doubled in the grassland biome sites since the original photographs were taken. Our repeat photo database is full of images which show an increase in grass cover, such as this one at Erin, just south of Middleburg or near Tarkestad, where there's been a complete biome shift. In 1946 at the site, it was dominated by shrubs but this growth form is now quite rare in the landscape and it is dominated now by grasses and Vichelia Karoo, which has overflowed from the ephemeral stream to which, it, to which it was initially confined. My colleague Justin de Toy has shown, however, that one should be cautious when interpreting the changes evident in photographs. Several years of drought, such as occurred in the Middleburg to Craddock region over the period 2017 to 2019, can result in the loss of grasses, which bounce back again after a few substantial rain events, such as seen in the bottom photographs taken just a few months later. I'd like to turn my attention now to issues concerned with the conservation of the Karoo and its future. Today, the protected area network of the succulent Karoo biome covers about 8% of the biome, while that of the Nama Karoo biome is much lower at about 1.6%, although this is set to increase with the declaration of a national park around the square kilometer array, which is more or less in the middle of the Nama Karoo biome. This conservation network is made up of several different types of protected areas, each with its own level of protection, its own management authority. These range from the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, of the Rochtesfeld and the Cape region, as well as the Goritz Cluster Biosphere Reserve, 
to the national parks, provincial nature reserves, private nature reserves, and protected environments, which are scattered throughout the Karoo. The establishment of the current network of protected areas in the succulent Karoo biome has to be one of the greatest conservation success stories in our country, especially since this has all unfolded in the last 35 years. So how did this happen? Government conservation agencies made important early contributions to the expansion of the protected area network in the succulent Karoo biome. However, it was the internationally funded initiative called the Succulent Karoo Ecosystem Planning Project, or SCEP for short, that provided the intellectual blueprint for the expansion of protected areas in the succulent Karoo, which went from close to zero in 1985 to close to 80% of the biome in 2020. SCEP involved more than 60 scientific experts and over 400 local stakeholders from government, academia, NGOs, the private sector interests and local communities. The process was based primarily on an understanding of the distribution of biodiversity and threats and the development of conservation targets to protect the most important vulnerable areas. But there's another reason why the area under conservation in the succulent career has expanded so rapidly, and that's the vision and contribution of one person, Mr. Leslie Hill. Leslie was a Cape Town boy, and he went to Sachs and UCT, where he obtained a degree in commerce in 1930. He had a lifelong interest in plants and a particular fondness for succulents, especially the gabayums. Leslie was a quiet and self-effacing person who shunned publicity, but in the mid-1990s, he established the Leslie Hill Succulent Karoo Trust. It was to be dedicated to the conservation of the succulent Karoo, and when he died in 2003, he instructed WWF South Africa to manage the trust. As a result of this generosity, Leslie became the first person to be recognized internationally by WWF as having made a gift to the earth as part of their Living Planet campaign. As soon as the trust was established, it got to work right away and hasn't really stopped. The graph on the top left shows a steady increase each year in the area that has been purchased for conservation by the trust. The axis along the bottom shows the years from 1995, while the y-axis is the area of land under conservation. In total, just over 230,000 hectares have been added, which amounts to about a third of all conservation land in the succulent Karoo. The other two-thirds have been added from the investments of the state via sand parks, Cape Nature or Denk from the Northern Cape, or from private nature reserves. An additional 60,000 hectares, which is not reflected in this blue line, have been added via the stewardship programs that have been supported by the Leslie Hill Trust and its partners, either in government or in the NGO sector. The graph on the right also shows that the trust has tried to honor the wishes of Leslie by focusing on those areas he stipulated in the trust deed, such as the Knasflakte and the Namakwale National Park. The bottom axis shows the names of the reserves, while the y-axis shows the area under conservation which the trust has bought. In this closing section, I'd like to touch briefly on some of the challenges facing the Karoo biome. When John Aycox warned of an expanding Karoo in the 1950s as a result of overgrazing, he couldn't have imagined some of the threats facing the Karoo today. In fact, this is probably the case for all of us who have worked on the Karoo. Recent social and infrastructural developments in the Karoo have happened so quickly over such a large area that we've been caught completely off guard and our researchers lag behind the need for information about these new developments. The first of these threats is poaching. Plants, reptiles and insects, such as the Cape Scarab beetles, are all targeted, often in coordinated efforts. Large plants, such as aloes and half mints, and small plants, such as the conophytums and lithops, are threatened. The collapse of pac pachypodiums, the half mints in the matched photo pair from Haramup in Bushmanland since the 1950s, is certainly due in part to theft. Large crater holes are evident on the hill slope where plants have been stolen. Even though individuals are caught red-handed and fined very heavily, there's been a recent uptick in poaching activities. It's really difficult to control, however, as it often occurs with the direct involvement of community members and local government or law enforcement officials. Alien invasive plants 
pose another threat. And the story goes that Persopus plants were once handed out by the Department of Agriculture as a useful fodder crop for livestock. The pods especially are nutritious and can be milled and mixed with other forage to make nutritious feed. However, today the spread of Persopus glandulosa and other species in the genus pose a threat to the ecology and hydrology of the Karoo. Prosopis can take over a catchment very quickly and completely dominate an area in dense thickets in which animals can get lost. There is hope for a biocontrol agent, but this seems still to be some way off. The mining industry poses another significant threat to the environments of the succulent Karoo. Men and their machines can remove a whole mountain in the space of just a few years, as we've seen on the Hamsburg. This quartzitic Inselberg supported key populations of endemic succulents, but much of the mountain's interior has now been removed for its heavy metals. The mining industry has been active along the west coast for a long time. The, the red areas on the map on the left show where diamonds have been mined. Very little of the west coast has been rehabilitated, and a quick tour on Google Earth will give you an idea of the devastation. However, there's still some important biodiversity areas along the Orange River, including the lichen fields around Alexander Bay. However, these two now appear to be threatened by a proposed project around the Bukhubai area. The idea is that a major industrial area could be established here to handle the products coming out of the Hamsburg and Achanais mines. Smaller but highly destructive mining activities in the area have also recently been reported on by John Yeld as well. The installation of wind farms, solar panels, and the associated infrastructure such as roads and power lines are other threats facing the Karoo. Although the actual installation only covers a relatively small area, the impact on especially birds and bats is poorly known. The work that has been done suggests that the power lines seem to be just at the right height to decapitate some of the big birds, such as the bustards, which traverse the Karoo. And what about fracking and its impact on Karoo biodiversity? All the work to date suggests that fracking poses a significant threat for the biodiversity of the Karoo. We know where the impacts are likely to be and the impact that fracking will have on the vegetation types in the different biomes. Thanks to Simon Todd's work, we also have an ecological sensitivity map which shows which parts of the affected areas will be affected most. We also have a very general sense of the impact of the different activities associated with fracking over the fracking cycle, from exploration through to closure of the fracking installation. The exploitation phase is clearly when most of the impacts will be felt and noise pollution, vehicle impacts and the activities of more people in the area are the activities of greatest concern. Very, very few studies, however, even in the international literature, have addressed the impact of fracking on biodiversity directly. The potential impact of climate change on the Karoo has been a concern for more than 20 years, ever since this report entitled The Heat Is On and a string of associated publications highlighted the problem. The climate change projections are quite similar to what John Aycox suggested would occur by 2050, although he suggested that grazing and not climate would be responsible for the expansion of deserts. There is evidence of change in key populations, such as these Allopilanzi individuals from Cornell's Kop in the Richtersveld, but it's difficult to ascribe this directly to climate change. However, the Karoo has just gone through the worst drought in living memory with substantial impacts on several iconic species and populations, and the threat is only expected to increase. The bulk of the research about the Karoo has been concerned with the environment. We know a fair amount about the biology of the Karoo and the influence of livestock, but far less about the impacts of the new developments on the region. There's also a big hole in the number of papers in the humanities, and here I include archaeology, anthropology, and the economic and social sciences. These are the areas where we need more effort and where interdisciplinary teams of researchers are needed. So this lecture is given on the occasion of me becoming a fellow of the Royal Society of South Africa, and I'm grateful to those who nominated me in the first place 
and to the committee for accepting my nomination. And thank you all for listening to my presentation.